Okay, so we're in cleaning and decontamination. On page 130. Ready, set, go. You should know what is clean. Cleaning is defined as the removal of all visible and non visible soils and other foreign material from medical devices being reprocessed. So we may need to make sure that we're removing the gross soil. Um, that should be done at point of use, actually. Um, and then all visible and non visible soils. <coughs> okay. Big topic here. <coughs> Look at the, um, the pictures on page 130, the dried soil inside of a bulb syringe. These things were, uh, they're, they're pretty much done away with. You can't clean something like that. But it is a good illustration of uh, some difficult uh, difficulty, some challenges faced during cleaning. There are other things that are very hard to clean, like this uh, arthroscopic shaver. The images you see were taken uh, by using a bore scope. A bore scope is a very thin little flexible scope that can go inside of devices and look and inspect during the cleaning process to see if the cleaning is being done right. Um, and then after the cleaning process to see if the cleaning has been done right. And on the next page 131, there is another system um, that uses a uh, fluorescence-based protein detection. I want to draw your attention to the picture on the bottom where it shows uh, biopsy forceps prior to reprocessing. So this is before cleaning. And what you see is uh, there's lots of gross soil on it. Using the fluorescence-based protein detection. After cleaning, the picture uh, to the to far right where it shows there's still some residual soil. But the picture in the middle, to the naked eye, this item looks like it's been cleaned properly. So, <clears throat> uh, you have to use your tools, you have to use your brain, you have to use your detergents, your enzymatics, and everything properly, and follow the instructions for use when cleaning. Flip the page to 132. Now, introduction to the decontamination area. I'm gonna hit some highlights here. You should know that, uh, there are safeguards in process for the cleaning of soiled items. We need to make sure that we're protecting the employees and the patients and everybody else who may come in contact with these items. <clears throat> in many cases, the decontamination area is located near the provider of the largest amount of soiled items, which is the operating room. Okay, conditions. You should know what the conditions are in the sterile processing department's decontamination area. You should know what the temperatures are, what the relative humidity is, and what the air exchanges are. Let me explain air exchanges. It's negative pressure in the decontamination room. <clears throat> so, contaminated air is vented out the ceiling. Well, I just turned red. Let me see if I can change that. Venting out the ceiling, contaminated air is sucked out of the, the top of the room. Um, so by doing this, it's ensuring that if the door opens or the passer window opens, it's not going to allow that contaminated air to go into the uh, any other area. Uh, we do consider that air to be contaminated because of the nature of the uh, activities in the room. Okay, 10 negative changes per hour. Know what the temperature range is and what the relative humidity is properly in decontamination. And uh, <clears throat> know that only people who have legitimate business in the decontamination room should be in there. This is true of our department. Um, Let's say it's just slightly more true in the decontamination room. You may see people wanting to use your uh, decontamination room or any part of your department as a shortcut or come in there just to chit chat. Uh, so this is this should not be allowed. <clears throat> the, the decontamination room is a hazardous place to work. And so you may need an emergency shower and eye wash station within so many feet or seconds of where the contamination could happen. 
it's not really just about contamination. It's also about the fact that there are chemicals being used in the decontamination room, which could uh, harm you if you get it in your eyes or on your skin. So because decontamination room is a very dirty place, uh, logically it follows that we should take, make extra efforts to try to keep it a clean place. Doing things like making sure that horizontal work surfaces get cleaned and disinfected routinely. Pay attention to these bullet points on page 133. Okay, I'm not gonna read them all to you. Read the bullet points on page 133. Um, and the definition of hazardous waste or I should say biohazardous waste, excuse me, that's what it says here. Um, this blood, um, little pieces of tissue, things like that. Anything that came out of the human body is considered to be a biohazardous and waste. <clears throat> so the dress code in the decontamination room is uh, it's your regular dress code for any other place in the department. And then you add your personal protective equipment. So if you're on the clean side or in the storage area, you're wearing your hospital provided scrubs, you're wearing your uh, hair covering, and in decontamination, you add to that your PPE, your personal protective equipment. So this is gonna protect you from splashes and uh, just you know, the things that you're removing from the instruments. Hand washing and frequent use of appropriate hand germicide agents is required. So <clears throat> when you, well, yeah, before you put on your PPE, you go ahead and wash your hands, put on your gloves, your PPE, you know, your, your gown, your hair covering, which you already had on, but now it magically becomes PPE when you're in a decontamination room. And, uh, when you take all of these off, wash up good. And then maybe go to the locker room and take off those dirty scrubs. Take a shower if you want to and go home in your street clothes. You should never wear your hospital provided scrubs to your home or out in public, especially if you've been in decontamination room because you've picked up microorganisms. Even though you're wearing your PPE, you've still picked up microorganisms. And per personal protective equipment is described on page 134. Okay, the three sink arrangement used for manual cleaning, manual cleaning. So manual cleaning means things that are being cleaned by hand. And many of these are then going into a mechanical cleaning process. And some of them are just going to be put through the pass-through window. So, <clears throat> The three sink arrangement is only possible if you have three sinks. I understand there are some decontamination departments that have, uh, don't have the appropriate type of sink. They may have one or two sink basins. Um, so I, I can't do anything to change that, but understand what this three sink arrangement is about. You clean, you rinse, and then you rinse in purified water. Purified water, like distilled or deionized or reverse osmosis. Changing colors again. What is going on? All right. So reverse osmosis, uh, pyrogen, distilled water, and deionized water are all defined here on page 135, and I guess I'm just gonna stay red. Okay, so know these things know them. Um, now we're on cleaning tool on page 136. Believe it or not, water is a very important cleaning tool. I know, you usually think of tools as screwdrivers and, well, wrenches and things like that. Um, your tools for cleaning include water and brushes and chemicals. <clears throat> Okay, when speaking of water, the best water to have would be pure water at a pH of seven. So since we're in on Earth and in Arizona, 
we don't really have pure water coming out of the tap. Um, many facilities though will have purified water coming out of a tap at the sinks, not all of them. Um, you, know, you really should have purified water coming out of the tap because you really should be using purified water as the final rinse on everything that you clean. Um, water pH and hardness needs to be kept in check. Soft water would be better than hard water for cleaning. Um, soft water is not appropriate for rinsing because soft water actually does have uh, some uh, salt in it, basically, which will leave marks or uh, spots on the instruments. Understand pH as it pertains to the cleaning process. Neutral is the most preferred. And cleaning brushes. Now, <clears throat> the cleaning brushes that you see on page 137 in that picture are the pH level comparison. Um, you have lumen brushes, lumen brushes, and then you have, uh, they're just handle brushes, we call them uh, toothbrush style brushes. Toothbrush style brushes come in nylon bristle or soft brass bristle or some other soft metal bristle. If you're using a metal brush on something, it needs to be have been approved by the manufacturer of the something uh, as to whether or not you can use a metal brush on it. Not everything can have a metal brush put on it. It can do some serious damage to uh, finishes on instruments or different materials. So we usually relegate metal brushes to routine stainless steel instruments that have some seriously difficult um, materials to remove from them, which uh, if we are in a place where we're really doing the topic of chapter seven correctly, um, those will probably be very greatly reduced, the amount of, uh, let's say, blood dried onto the serrations of a clamp. You should use the correct brush size. So I'm gonna use the broom analogy. Are you ready? The broom analogy goes like this. When you are brushing, I mean, when you're sweeping the floor, um, do you hold the broom so it's just slightly over the top of the floor, maybe occasionally touching the floor? No, because that wouldn't remove the dirt you're trying to remove. Do you hold the broom, you press it down so hard that really all it does is sort of smear the dirt around? No. So proper size lumen brush means you're going to be using a brush that is neither uh, too large and going to smear the things around or too small and just going to occasionally hit the inside of the lumen. Um, proper size lumen brush can be determined by looking at the IFU or there are different charts or you could literally stick the brush into the lumen and see if it seems to be doing some brushing activity and is long enough to go through the entire length of the lumen. These brushes that we're talking about uh, they're usually, uh, they're not necessarily single use, but they're, they're, uh, they're disposable, um, not single use. So you can use one until its usefulness has um, gone away, until it's used up. Like the picture where it says discard brushes when they're worn. One of them looks like um, an old toothbrush that you've been using to scrub the toilet with for about a year and a half. Yeah, that, that should have been thrown away a long time ago. Cleaning cloths are also used. So cleaning cloths should be used once and then put into the hamper um, so that you limit cross-contamination. They should always be um, lint-free. Lint-free is always better. Low lint is uh, acceptable uh, provided that you're going to rinse any lint off of the objects. Let's just go with lint-free. Sponges. Sponges um, really should be single use. We're talking of these sponges that it shows on page 138 at the top. These are used for flexible endoscopes. And in order to eliminate the potential for cross-contamination from one scope to another, because that is a big deal, um, they should be single use. They usually come impregnated, already filled up with some uh, detergent that you can use on the scope and then throw it away. So if you are using them repeatedly, I will tell you, do not 
um, think that you can clean this and uh, it's not gonna happen. You should replace them at least daily. All right.